Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of James. Turn in your Bibles to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, focusing on one verse in this small epistle today, that's verse 12. We went down to verse 11 last week, and verse 13 starts a a different topic. And we have more uh, than we can bite off and chew here this morning in verse 12. Um, stand, if you will, uh, honor the reading of God's Word and follow along. Uh, We'll read it twice just so we get it. James chapter 5, verse 12. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Again, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Father, may the words on the page leap and grab our attention, bring us into focus upon the truths contained herein. Father, as we do so, may we examine our own lives because the Word is intended to instruct us, to convict us, to train us, to educate us, to provide that which is necessary for us in equipping us for your service. And we'll give you thanks and praise for what you'll do here in our hearts and in our midst this morning. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. I've entitled the message today, Be Trustworthy. Be trustworthy. Um, Last session we had in verse 7, we were to be patient. Um, And uh, also in verse 8, be also patient. So we saw patience as a command there in our last session. Here we see trustworthiness as a topic. You ever heard the expression, that's the honest to God truth. You ever heard that? I can't, if I had a penny for every time I heard it or said it, uh, I haven't said it for years, but I used to say things like that. That's the honest to God truth. How about, I swear on the Holy Bible that that's true. <laughs> you know, if you, if you want to, if you want to try to convince somebody that you're speaking the truth, you say, I swear on the Bible, it's the truth. But if you really want to stress and emphasize that point, you'll say, I swear on the Holy Bible that that's true. It's amazing. What we're looking at today is this thing called swearing. In verse 12, you see that short phrase early in the verse, swear not. Swear not. That's really what we're looking at today. This verse focuses on that, and it's a truth that's not found in the previous or the section after this. So we deal with this in a separate issue, and the Bible has a lot to say. We're not going to cover everything the Bible has to say about it, because the word swear means an oath, an oath. In biblical times, it was an oath, Uh, and oaths were appropriate in those days. But here, um, the issue is more about being honest and true in what we say. James talked about uh, other commands uh, in this uh, section of Scripture. I mean, we talked about verses 7 and 8, to be patient, those are commands. In verse 9, uh, Uh, In verse 9, the word grudge means to murmur. Murmur not means don't complain. So be patient in verses 7 and 8. Don't complain in verse 9. In verse 13, uh, Lord willing, we get that far. Uh, What we find there, 
uh, let him pray. There's a command to pray. The word let, uh, typically in the scriptures, and it is in this verse, is a command. Let him pray. Um, And then if you look in verse 14, um, it says also there in the middle of the verse, and let them pray. Another command. Be patient. Don't complain. Pray. And then if you look at verse 16, it says to confess. And that's a command as well. <clears throat> so in the, mid, in the middle, and they're not the only commands in the book of James, but they're the ones that are right around. And God gives a series of commands here. <clears throat> and what we find is this command in verse 12, swear not. Swear not. <clears throat> but I want to talk about the phrase that opens this verse first. The word but at the beginning of the verse is not a sharp contrast. But is translated uh, from a few different Greek words in the New Testament. This is not one of those that's a sharp contrast where you got this, but in a sharp contrast is this. <clears throat> the word actually could be translated and. <clears throat> so it's kind of insignificant uh, as far as contrast is concerned from the previous section of Scripture. But what we see here, it says, above all things, my brethren, above all things. Whenever we see a phrase like that, it's designed to bring to focus and attention the critical importance of something. So I'll put the outline in the bulletin, but the first point that I wanted to to make as the Lord led me through the study of this to, to, to teach the word that he's given to us is um, the critical importance of speaking the truth. The critical importance of speaking the truth. <clears throat> and we're going to get into the meat of the matter, but just this above all things gives, a per, gives us a perspective about what God's about to tell us. As we read this verse two times at the outset, <clears throat> you read it and it's just another verse of Scripture. No. And yes. <laughs> um, I think we have a tendency, if you were to take in, <clears throat> in your devotion time and you were to read the fifth chapter <clears throat> of James, this verse may not even stand out in your reading. It may not even stand out. And that's another reason to focus on this for just a few moments today. Because what happens is we read through a passage of Scripture and not everything strikes us as important as other things. I mean, that's that's typical. Whether we we read a book or we read a manual. Uh, How many times have I read a manual and I read through it and I start doing the, the project to put something together? And what happened? I go back and read the instructions. I was like, oh, I wasn't paying attention to that part of it. I got to do take care of that. Because you read through and you see things. And, uh, you know, in the study of psychology, I understood um, perception. And that's why we can all take a sentence and we can read it independent of one another. And then we can go, each of us can go tell if they say there's 20 people here, tell 20 other people, each of us tell one person, and they tell another person, and by the time it comes back, there's nothing similar about what we read individually. It's because there are filters. If, if, if a stranger were to come into this room and look in and say, okay, I want you to go in, and for five seconds, I want you to look at it. You come back out and say, okay, what did you see? <clears throat> did you see a plant? Maybe they didn't see the plant, right? Maybe they saw the cross. Maybe they saw the piano. They saw the pews. They saw the pulpit. They saw the stand. Maybe they didn't even bother. It didn't register. Because we can't take in everything. You know, there are objects in the windows, and a couple of them. They may not have seen those things. And sometimes we look through a passage of Scripture, and we sort of gloss over it. I think this is one of those verses where a lot of people gloss over it. The word swear that's used here does not refer to the use of profanity. That's covered in other sections of Scripture. Obviously, we're not to let evil communication proceed from our mouth. We have that construction from the Lord. But this isn't talking about the use of profanity. Profanity is not even in mind here. Oh, yeah, somebody could insert some profanity and in making an oath, swearing by something, 
Uh, you know, late last night, as I was driving Trace home, uh, uh, typically I listen to WFIA, and there was some strange preacher on, and I didn't like it, so I turned it over to Easily Listening Music. Well, that station just happened to be on the radio um, when I got in the truck to come to the church this morning. And guess what song was playing? The title of the song is I Swear. Some of you know that song. I Swear by the Moon and the Stars is the way the chorus goes. I Swear by the Moon and the Stars. And it's a love song. Uh, a person promising how much they really love somebody else. And because if I say I love you, sometimes we think that's not enough. We've got to throw some extra stuff in there. You know? And so we start inserting things so that we can attempt to persuade and convince somebody that what I'm saying is actually true. I want to thank Sister Arlene and uh, her husband, Willard, for their 59 years of marriage. You got us by a few years. But 59 years ago, you promised, you promised to be his wife till you die. You're not dead yet, and you're still his wife. You fulfilled that promise. How many marriages fail because people don't mean what they say? Oh, they go into a wedding, they're infatuated, they're in love. Maybe it's a short or long engagement. But when they start living with that person, they have irreconcilable differences. That's one of the major reasons for divorces these days. Irreconcilable differences. Fancy term, isn't it? It means we can't get along. The reason we don't get along in those situations is because we don't want to get along. We see something we don't like all of a sudden, and the grass looks greener on the other side. So our promise doesn't mean anything. How many marriages have people given vows and promised, promised to be a husband or a wife with that spouse until death they part? 50% of marriages end up in divorce. I think people are in, a lot of those are multiple marriages. There's a few people around that stick with it and, and perform the vows that they gave. Because uh, as a believer, when you promise to love somebody until you die and to be their, their spouse, it's a promise. It's a promise. God holds us accountable for promises. He holds us accountable. So when one marriage fails and somebody goes out and gets into another marriage, think about this. You marry somebody you've been married before, and if it's, if it's you know, not a widowed situation where somebody passed away or something like that, what you find is they broke that promise and oftentimes wondered, so what makes the new attractive person think that they're not going to break the promise the next time? I know I can't get over that. A promise is a promise is a promise. And this thing, what I wanted to emphasize here, it says above all things. The above all things gives this critical importance to speak. Because it says above all things. The, word above, the phrase above all things means especially, especially, especially this thing. That is not to swear and um, give relative to the other commands. So we read some other commands just in this chapter. And above all those others, this is of critical importance. It doesn't mean the others aren't important. It means this is critical above all things. You find this in a couple of places in Scripture. So when you find above all things, it means let this rise up to a level of importance. When we read that phrase, we might just gloss over it above all things and not even get the point because God puts it in for a reason. We don't have a ton of books. We don't have a library full of books that God has given to us as he has spoken to us to instruct us. What we have is one book. And we can read this for our entire lifetime and glean short, small phrases that seem insignificant and learn a lot. But this is of critical importance, this issue where God is commanded not to swear because we, we do it uh, oftentimes without even thinking. We do it flippantly. And that's what this verse really addresses. It's the flippant use of promises to do something. 
The flippant use of promises to do something. We're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. When we have to qualify what we're saying with some words that might try to convince somebody that it's true, then we're trying, we're trying to avoid the perception that what we're going to say is not really right. <clears throat> you know, when, you know when, a, when a husband and a wife and there comes an issue between them, you know, maybe, maybe there's some attraction to another person or something. And when they come back together and the person says, the, so let's just, for an example, take the husband to the wife. The husband says to the wife, I promise you I won't do that again. Why wouldn't the wife look at the husband and say, you promised me that you'd love me till you died? <laughs> right? Promises aren't to be used flippantly, but they are used oftentimes to get us out of a pickle, to get us out of a jam, to save face, to present a, a, a heart attitude that is different than what really resides within us. And so it's deception. The use of swearing by things to add things to a promise that we make are used that we might try to convince somebody that what we're saying is true. Be Why? Because we're not trustworthy. I titled the sermon, Be Trustworthy. Whenever you say something, whenever I say something, people ought to be able to trust that it's true and it's accurate. We don't have to add a lot of things to it. We don't have to... You know, swear by a Bible. We don't have to swear by the moon or the stars or in the name of the Lord or anything else. When we say it, it ought to be the truth. Every, every place that I've worked, every place that I've worked, beginning the first time I was a supervisor, <clears throat> I told the people I supervise, I've said it here before, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you until you prove yourself untrustworthy. Then I'm not going to trust you. And I, and I didn't make a big deal of it, but I repeated it so that they would understand what I said. I'm going to trust you until you prove yourselves untrustworthy. And when somebody proved to me that they were untrustworthy, I didn't put trust in them anymore. You know, I gave, I, I gave work to people who were trustworthy, and I moved people out, fired some people. But the thing is that if, if, you're, if, you're, going to, if you're going to act and behave with integrity... And you're responsible for other people because uh, in, in all the days that I was supervising people, I had to produce something, you know, or, or I had to, to manage a process. And the integrity of that process was dependent upon me because I was the leader. So I don't want somebody who's not trustworthy working in that arena. It'd be no different than if I was untrustworthy. And I think we have a lot of, and one of the hardest things for any manager to do is to hold employees accountable. Hey, well, it's really kind of a minor thing. It's not a minor thing if you prove yourself untrustworthy. If you say you were too sick to come to work, and I see your Facebook page the next week where you were out at, you know, the amusement park or at Disney World, I'm not going to trust you anymore. I'm not going to trust you. I'm just not going to trust you. So then the next time that person would say, hey, I really, I promise this time, I promise that I'm homesick. Why are they having to say all those things? Probably because they're not going to be homesick. They want to try to convince me that they really are. I had to deal with a lot of that in all the years that I worked in, uh, in personnel, if you will. But this is just a pause for a second to say this is critically important. Above all things, my brethren... He's talking to his brethren. We know that. We've seen that phrase many times. We reviewed it one time in our studies, the use of brethren. This is addressed to the believers in that day. Now, the second point I want to make regards this phrase, swear not. And that is the command to stop swearing. The command to stop swearing. He says, swear not. Neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. So neither by heaven, heaven is God's throne. The earth is God's footstool. So don't take any element of God's purview and use that as an opportunity to try to convince and persuade somebody that you're truthful when in fact you don't have any real intention to be truthful. Maybe in that moment you are, but if you have a pattern of breaking promises, you're not trustworthy. You're not trustworthy. You're not trustworthy. If... Uh, 
You know, if you, if, you, if you ask somebody, did you do that? Yeah, I did that. And then the next day you find out they didn't do that. Why would you trust that person again? Why would you do that? Uh, when they told you they did it, it would be a lot better to be truthful and say, no, I didn't do it. And then give the real reason why you didn't do it. Because then people want to start adding some lies. Well, I didn't get it done because, oh, I didn't have time. Boy, that's one of the biggest excuses, isn't it? I didn't have time. But it says, swear not. Again, swear means to take an oath. Uh, and this is, um, it's appropriate to take oaths in the name of the Lord. The Bible, in fact, you, uh, the use of oaths is, is, is an approved manner in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> All the way through the scriptures, there are oaths. And they're appropriate. For instance, when you go to court, you get into a courtroom and you're a witness. <clears throat> they ask you to tell, promise to tell the whole truth, right? According to God. And maybe they put your hand, like when our leaders are sworn in, um, they have to put their hand in the Bible and they promised, right? <clears throat> it's appropriate to do that. It's appropriate to do that. When you get married, it's appropriate to promise to love your husband or your wife. It's appropriate to promise to, to live through thick and thin with them. It's appropriate. In an ordination of a minister or a deacon, uh, it's appropriate to, to, to promise to serve the Lord acceptably in that office. It's appropriate. If you're given a deposition before you go to court and you sit down in with lawyers and they ask you to promise that you're telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth, it's appropriate. But here's the, the key thing. When it is appropriate, we better be telling the truth. And we might get away with it if we don't tell the truth in, with people, but not before God. <clears throat> not before God. And we're going to look at a pattern of swearing inappropriately and what that leads to at the conclusion of our study. But there are numerous examples. I want you to turn back to Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30. And we see over here in Numbers chapter 30... This is just one for instance. I'm not going to go through numerous biblical examples of oaths uh, that are appropriate. Promises. God promises things, right? He made a promise to Abraham. He made a promise to David. <clears throat> In Numbers chapter 30, the first verse, this, is, uh, this section is, is a law of vows. It's, the, it's how God considers it appropriate to operate and what's required when we're given vows. So in Numbers 30, verse 1, And Moses spoke unto the heads of the tribes, 12 tribes of Israel, concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. It's a command from God. Verse 2, If a man, this is the person, so if a person vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with the bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. It's plain and simple right there in verse 2 of Numbers chapter 30. There's no excuse for not performing. We are to do everything possible in order to accomplish that which we have promised to do. It's that which God requires of us. Now, we go back to our text over in James. So the, the issue is not to swear. And it's a command to swear not. Um, and so this is really a speech issue. This is really a speech issue. Because if somebody catches you in a lie, let's say uh, a husband catches his wife cheating on him. It's not something that she said, but it's something that she promised when they got married that she wouldn't do. I'll be faithful to you as long as I live. And so now she's been unfaithful. So we understand that, but it's a, why is it a speech issue then? It's a speech issue because the person promised to do something that they didn't do. The, you may say, well, no, it's, a, you know, it's just a mistake. It's just, uh, a lot of people do that now when they put these blurbs out there and they say things that seemingly are discriminatory or racist or things like that. And then when they get called on the carpet and it hits the big news, the first thing they do is, I apologize, that's not what I meant to say. And I wonder how many times people are lying when they say, I didn't really mean it. 
I've always said that probably 99.9% .9 of those cases, what happened the first time is what they meant to do. Now they know that they have to cover it up because other people didn't consider it acceptable. And especially if you're in the public eye, you know, maybe you're, you know, you're, you're no, notorious in our United States, you're going to get peeled back and they're going to get down to the truth of this matter. And you got to do a whole lot of what I call backstroke. You got to start backpedaling and going back and you got to try to explain yourself away. And they use all kinds of hyperbole in order to get to the point where they might convince people that I really, really didn't mean that. I swear that isn't the way that I meant that, right? And so you throw that swear in there, and that is an attempt to get people to believe what you're saying when what you're saying isn't really believable. James and speech issues are not a stranger to James. Let's go back to chapter 1 in James and look at verse 26. <clears throat> chapter 1 and verse 26 James wrote, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Controlling the tongue. So bridling the tongue. Controlling the tongue is controlling our speech. Controlling what we say. Now we are not, you know, the scripture tells us that no man can control the tongue. It's not even possible. We can't do it. It's not possible. James told us that. It's not possible. Well, how can we control the tongue? The Holy Spirit. Because God gives us the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, and we have the full enablement, the full enablement to control our tongue right here within. We just need to listen and obey the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter 2 and verse 12. Over there, James said, So speak ye, and so do. Um, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Over here what we find is we need to talk, so speak ye, speak like a believer. <clears throat> Don't just say things that believers would say. Be a believer and say the truth. That's what believers do. That's what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> because lying has never. So if we have a for instance, no liar shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Scripture is clear. We'll say, well, I've told a lie. Okay, up until the time you were saved by the grace of God, all those sins were forgiven. What have you done since then? Is there still a consistent pattern of lying? If there's still a consistent pattern of lying, are you still a liar? And you know, James, remember, he, he gets into the test of our faith. That's what all this is. He starts out in chapter 1 and, um, and verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into various uh, or die diverse temptations or various trials, knowing this, that the trying or testing of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work. We're, trials test our faith. One of the things that test our faith is whether or not we tell the truth. The reason a lot of people have to swear in order to tell the truth, supposed truth, is because they're not trustworthy. They've proven themselves untrustworthy. They've proven themselves to lie on occasion. <clears throat> but for the person who professes to be a believer, if there's a pattern of lying and it just continues as it did before, has there really been a genuine salvation experience? Has it really been genuine? You know, Paul wrote to Titus and said they profess that they know God, but in works, they deny Him. James says faith without works is dead. It's fake faith. <clears throat> what are works? Works are righteous works. Righteous works in service to God. That whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God. You say, well, everything I do is not for God. Really? We're no longer our own. We've been bought with the price. We're the servant of God. We're the slave of God. People don't like that word slave anymore. We're a slave of God, according to the, the scriptures. But it's that we, we literally have been set free from the bondage of sin. And now we have a, a, a yoke which is easy. The Lord has given to us. And we're in service to Him. We can't serve ourselves. We can't serve somebody else. And a lie is always to serve ourselves. 
and serves ourselves. When Abraham lied about his wife being his sister, he was lying to protect himself. How many times do we do that? You say, well, there's a good result. Well, the good result is because God can get the results he wants regardless of how people act and behave. But lying's never appropriate. So if we have a pattern of lying, if we have a pattern of swearing, and we've talked about it, some examples that we might be more in agreement with here, although we ought to be in agreement with those as well. If somebody is in a homosexual relationship and they say, I'm going to, it's a sin. I'm going to give up that sin and I'm going to live a life that's pleasing to God. They supposedly receive Christ by faith and they continue to live in that lifestyle and homosexual lifestyle. Have they really been saved? You might say, no. So somebody who continues in a pattern of lying throughout their life, have they been saved? Well, yeah. Why? Because we don't consider lying little white lies. We put white on there to, so that we can be approved. It'll be approved by us and probably approved by others. It's just a white lie. So homosexuality, no, nah, those people aren't really saved. Lying, yeah, it's okay. Everybody does it. That's our problem. That's our problem. We've got to be trustworthy. And so the scripture here goes on um, uh, to say there in, oh, I wanted to, to go back. Look at chapter, I was talking about speech. In chapter 3 and verses 2 to 11 um, is a whole section of scripture devoted to have an integrity in speech. <clears throat> um, and in verse 2, for in many things, <clears throat> literally we stumble. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also the bridle the whole body. And then it talks about taming the tongue. So again, controlling our speech. Chapter 4 and verse 11 tells us not to speak evil of one another. And in chapter 5 here, it tells us not to, in verse 12, it tells us not to swear. So we have these uses of this. And in that day, there was a system of complex um, oaths that the, that the Jews had established in their traditions. And it just became commonplace just became commonplace much as it is today if you think about it and you listen carefully you'll hear a lot of promises in the course of communication with each other perhaps some that we're making ourselves <clears throat> that we promised something based on something else i promise on the word of god that that's true well if if it's true why do we have to tell somebody that we swear that it's true based on the Bible. Because every time we do that, you know, the scripture tells us here in verse 12, don't swear by the earth or by any, by the heaven or earth or by any other oath. Any other oath. Our speech, I want to say one more thing about this. Our speech is a reflection of our spiritual condition. Our speech is a reflection of our spiritual condition. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33. Matthew 5 and verse 33. Our speech <clears throat> is a reflection of our spiritual condition. In Matthew chapter 5 <clears throat> and verse 33, you know, I heard, I heard just yesterday a preacher say, <clears throat> I think it was that one I turned off last night, <clears throat> Um, he said, he said, this is in the word of God and Jesus himself said it. Let me ask a question. Are the words in red in your scripture? If you have a red letter edition, are the words in red more important than the words in black? No, it's all the word of God. It's all the word of God. <clears throat> what we have is, is Jesus when he walked on earth here in the gospels, when he walked on earth, and when he's quoted at other times in the scripture, uh, like in, in Corinthians, Paul talks about um, the, how the Lord talked to him uh, regarding the thorn in the flesh that he had. But it's all the word of God. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. In verse 14 of that chapter, and the word was made flesh. The word is the word of God. The word of God was made flesh. The word was in the beginning. So what Jesus said while he was on earth was in the beginning, the word. 
So just because it's red letters doesn't mean it's more important. Just understand that what we're reading over in James chapter 5 that was penned by James but yet breathed, inspired by God, is just as true as what Jesus said and is quoted as saying. But in Matthew 5 and verse 33, <clears throat> again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old, that is the rabbinical traditions here, not the word of God, thou shalt not... Um, uh, literally, the word uh, there, uh, forswear, means to perjure thyself. But should you not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, that's what the rabbinical tradition had established. Verse 34, he says, but I say unto you, so here's the truth, swear not at all. See, what James said is a reiteration of what Jesus said here <clears throat> in this situation and he says, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by the earth, for it is footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. <clears throat> but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatever is more than these cometh of evil. Whatever is more cometh from evil. Now look at Matthew chapter 12. Anything more than then your yes is yes and your no is no. When you say something, you don't have to swear because what we should be doing, uh, the Lord said, is that that communication where we tell the truth is sufficient. If you always tell the truth, nobody's going to question you. Nobody's going to be able to say, well, you lied about it because you lie about this. You lie. No, because you're saying truthfully. Now in chapter 12 of Matthew, if we look at verse 34... Matthew 12, verse 34. <clears throat> o generation of vipers, the Lord said, how can you, how can you, being evil, speak good things? And he was speaking to a generation of vipers. These were sinners he was talking about. They were the religious leaders. They were those who had self-righteousness and so they didn't have the righteousness of God. They were sinners. <clears throat> it says, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the, this is the thought I want to get to. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's like an iceberg. What you say is like the tip of the iceberg. What's inside is a whole mountain of stuff that that came out of. And that's why I say typically you see these people and they say these things and they're obviously racist or discriminatory when they say them in the public eye. That tip of the iceberg is going to come out every once in a while if it's in your heart. That's what Jesus is saying. It's out of the abundance of the heart. Where, what comes out of your mouth, there's a whole ton of this stuff inside and we just saw a little teensy bitsy teeny bit of it. It's just a small part. Remember when somebody tells that lie... And they're found out. That's the heart. Jesus said again, the last part of verse 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So what we say is a real sign of our spiritual condition. So when you see somebody whose speech, whose, whose speech is inconsistent with the word of God on a regular basis, it comes from a wellspring of the same stuff on the inside. Abundance of it on the inside. Don't think, well, you know, they just said a little. There's a whole lot more to the story that we don't know that God does know. Because he knows even the thoughts and intents of our heart. You know, we say things like, God is my witness. Oh, I like this one. God knows my heart. <laughs> if you really want to try to convince somebody, <clears throat> well, yeah, I'm a believer. Uh, you know, I, God knows my heart. Maybe they issued some profanity or something, right? Or maybe they got caught in a lie. And so somebody criticizes that. And what do they say? Well, God knows my heart. In other words, my heart's clean. It's whole. It's well. There's nothing wrong with it. God knows it. You've got no business judging me. <laughs> How about uh, for heaven's sake? You ever say that? As God is my judge, not much different than God is my witness or God knows my heart, but we try to convince people with the, through these oaths, if you will, or swearing, um, that, which are intended to deceive others because that's not really, we, we have to add things to it to give a condition that looks pure when in fact the condition in the heart is not pure. 
because it came out of an abundance of the heart. Next, I want to go back to chapter 5 and verse 12 in James. <clears throat> so we have the critical importance of uh, speaking the truth. We have the command to stop swearing. And we have the command to exercise integrity whenever we're speaking. Uh, it says in the middle of the verse, but, this is a strong contrast, but let, as, as opposed to swearing, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Just say the truth. Integrity is so critically important. But we begin, we begin adding stuff to it, muddying the waters. And we get pretty good at constructing sentences and trying to, to, to persuade people and convince people that we're a lot better than we are. The yes should be yes and the no should be no. It means whatever we say is what we mean and it's really what's on the inside. And you don't have anything to hide. You don't have anything to hide if you're a believer who's intent to tell the truth. You've got nothing to hide. People who tell lies got closets full of skeletons. The truth will cost us immediately. And that's why we don't tell the truth oftentimes. It costs us right now. Lies will eventually catch up with us. Um, so what's required here is when a person speaks with integrity over time, they build a reputation of integrity. Um, uh, and uh, deception, I wrote down a note here to myself. Deception, uh, the use of oaths is deception and imp an and impatient shortcut to deceive others that we are trustworthy when we're not. Because trustworthiness takes time. Integrity takes time. So we've got caught in something that's not truthful. So we start swearing to try to make up some ground and try to get us further ahead in the process. Just start telling the truth. And then from that point on, people will know. People will know. What's the last part of this verse? It says in verse 12 at the end, lest. The word lest is a very interesting word. The word means in order to prevent the chance that something's going to happen. In order to prevent the chance. What is it that is to be done in order to prevent the chance that we fall into condemnation? <clears throat> Have integrity and truthfulness and honesty in our speech. Because if we don't do that, we're not preventing the falling into condemnation. Now, condemnation here <clears throat> is not discipline. It's not punishment uh, or chastening, if you will. It's not discipline. He's talking to the brethren. But what he's saying here, James always given that test of faith. Faith without works is dead which he talked about in chapter 4. Faith without works, it's fake faith. If you have real faith in the Lord, then you're, gonna, you're not going to swear. Your yes is going to be yes. Your no is going to be no. You're going to be known to be truthful and honest and trustworthy. You're going to have integrity in what you say. You're going to know that if, you, if, you, if you're doing things the right way. And if you're not doing those things, there's a danger the danger is we think we're saved by the grace of God, but our life does not show a pattern of consistent behavior that demonstrates one who has been saved. It demonstrates a person who's still living in the world. In which case, it's like, as I mentioned earlier, in Titus 1.16, where Paul addressed him and said, there are people that profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everybody says, Lord, Lord, unto me shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. What's God's will? Be trustworthy. That's God's will. So if we're not being trustworthy, were we really saved to start with? Because you see, there's a sense of belonging in a, in a, in a local church where we feel safe. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, says, examine yourself to see whether or not you be in the faith. This is a good opportunity to do that. If our life is showing a consistent pattern 
of lies and not speaking honestly and truthfully, if the pattern of our behavior is like it was before we got saved, <clears throat> that never changed in our life, we should be a new creation. There has to be a change. Our mind is renewed when we get saved by the grace of God. We're no longer conformed to this world. The old man's been put away. If we're still showing a consistent pattern of sinful behavior, then likely there's not a new person. And so that's what brings condemnation. Condemnation is eternal judgment by God. And eternal judgment comes for those people because <clears throat> what he's saying here is if you're still engaged in all this activity where the, what comes out is the tip of the iceberg and there's a whole wealth of the abundance of the same thing on the inside, we're not a new creation. So it's a check point for our faith. And the check point is, are we still swearing? Swear not. Swear not. When we have to embellish what we say or put forward to be truthful, it's likely not truthful if we have to embellish it. And what God's saying is don't try to embellish what you're saying to try to deceive people into thinking that that's who you really are. The use of these things is typically to cover something up. That's why it's a deception. Swear not, the scripture says. Let your yea be yea and your no be no, lest you fall into condemnation. And that is because you really don't have faith at all. And no believer, <clears throat> no believer who thinks they're a believer wants to be told that maybe they're not a believer. But you know what? More important than continuing our pattern and believing that we're okay <clears throat> is stopping and checking and saying, you know, if I'm not really saved by the grace of God, may, my life is showing a pattern that's very much like it was before. There's a point in our life where we got saved. <clears throat> Some people say, well, I'm not really sure when that was, you know. Well, you know, there's a, there is a dividing point in our life. There's a dividing point because there came a day in our life we gave our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. We put our trust and our confidence and our hope in Him. And what God did is a supernatural transaction. He literally put the dead man to rest and He took and made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. And all of the elements of that new creation are going to come forward. Not all at once, but over time we're going to grow and we're going to grow and mature spiritually. So if that's not there, likely there wasn't an experience. You ask folks, when did you get saved? And I don't know. I don't know, 9, 10, 11 years old. And you may not know what the date was, but what you will know is the fact that because it has to be, it's the, it's the most important thing any person will ever do. How can we not remember that? We will remember it if we're truly saved by the grace of God. And it will make a dramatic difference in our life. I remember I was sitting in the, in the aisle and the pastor was standing in the pulpit when he ordained me. He says, from this point forward, you're not going to have that many friends. He says, you're going to have less than a handful of friends. And I'll venture to say, I don't have people coming to my house and knocking on my door and coming in. Nobody wants to talk to the preacher. Oh yeah, they tolerate me when I go places and I, and you know, because we like the same activities, but they're going to hear it. They're going to know it. They're going to know that I'm different. Not because of who I am, but because of God, God is and what God's done in my life. Because I surrendered to Him. Folks, if we look the same in our lives today as we did before we got saved, there's no real transformation. There's no real transformation. And part of this is, and this is a pivotal point in this book of James. It's a checkpoint for our salvation. Because what he says here, you're liable, to, you will fall into condemnation. If your life is still the way it used to be and you're still having to try to deceive other people by claiming to be somebody you're not by saying, saying things that aren't really true because you want them to believe that. You're just trying to deceive people. Swear not. Let's stand together. Father, your love, again, is so amazing.
as well as your grace. Oh, Father, we're so thankful and grateful for who you are and how you cared for us even while we were yet sinners. You commended your love towards us. Thank you, Father, that you have continued to do that and that you have convicted our hearts that we would find a need, a definite need to put our faith in Christ. And since that time that you gave us that great gift of salvation, we have found through your word, through the convicting power of our teacher, the Holy Spirit, to lead a life that is consistent with the gospel. We are to walk worthy of the word. Father, let us not, let us not deceive. Let us not swear to embellish what we, what we call the truth, <clears throat> that others might believe it when in fact it's all a cover-up. Father, there's, thank you for convicting us that there's no need to embellish truthful speech. There's no need to embellish it. We just say yes and no, and that's sufficient. And we thank you, Father, for guiding us through your word today, for uh, digging deep into our heart to plant the seeds that we might continue to grow spiritually in our lives. And may this be another area where we will take positive and real actions in order to be more pleasing in your sight. Yeah, we're not perfect, Father, but there's no excuse for swearing. And so we need, to, we need to give it up. We need to relinquish it. You have commanded us to swear not. So, Father, may, may it be new from here on in our speech that would truly be a reflection of the spirituality that's within. And, Father, if there's any here who have, have, you've revealed to them today that they're not truly saved by your grace, save them today. Oh, Father, it's so critically important to know for a surety that we've been saved by your grace, <clears throat> not just to pretend that we're to be somebody that we're not. And we'll give you praise and thanks as you continue to work in our hearts as we ponder and meditate on these truths in the days and weeks ahead. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.